Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it was a great introduction, though uh, they did forget my high school basketball career. <laughs> Uh, but we didn't have the three-point shot then, so uh, it was difficult, you know, for a short guy. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to talk about two things. One is uh, the issue of trust and relating this to uh, an internal controls reporting study that we published. And second of all, I'm going to uh, take a different view toward this paper that the Hanson firm has uh, put together, which represents not their views, but the views of uh, actually the views of of Marty Lipton, Larry yeah. Sassini, the, the views of the people who whose livelihood is based on representing management. So just to understand that. Okay, in terms of trust, the way I look at it is most companies are run by honest people, but we have a certain percentage that have uh, big problems. You mentioned, well, you thought the lower tier in some sense. and. So, like in Canada now, we have home capital, so that's not doing so well, and it scares people. So the question is basically how accountants and <coughs> lawyers and boards can reduce the number of home capitals and how the public can feel better about that. And one of the aspects of this is internal controls. This came in in... Sarbanes-Oxley in 2002. It's probably the most controversial part of uh, Sarbanes-Oxley. There are two aspects of this. One is management makes a report on internal controls, uh, and that's usually published. And then in the US, but not Canada, uh, if you're a company with more than 75 million market cap, the auditor does an attestation, which isn't a full, a full audit, but they essentially review the report and they issue their own report. Uh, and uh, so, so it's sort of a natural experiment in how that would work. So I had the benefit of someone from Audit Analytics who actually is a data person, and she went through all the data. Uh, we looked at 2009 to 2016. And we looked at all the companies that had financial restatements because we figured that was a good uh, group of people that had problems. And uh, there were 78 companies over 75 million in market cap because we wanted to compare it to the US. And we then took out anybody who we felt didn't meet a 5% quantitative test, meaning that the net income or revenues changed by more than 5%, or didn't meet uh, a qualitative test, like if you had multiple restatements. Uh, that was qualitatively material. So we brought down the number 78 to 43 financial restatements that were clearly material by quantitative and, and uh, qualitative standards. And what's interesting of the 43, only 14 uh, said in their filings that they had a material weakness in their internal controls. You have an ability as a, as a management to say you have no problems, you have a significant efficiency, in which case you report it to the audit committee, or you have a material weakness. Let me just give you a feel for this. There were 11 companies that had two or three restatements in six years. None of, <coughs> most of them did not report an, material, an internal control weakness. I find that not credible. Uh, there was a company called Orca that re, in its financial restatement reduced its net income by 30%. They did not report an internal controls. They said that they talked to their auditor and everybody was okay with it. There's another company called New Flyers where the earnings per share <coughs> went from 98 cents a share to 81 cents a share. They didn't think they had an internal controls problem. So <clears throat> these are pretty blatant examples, and they do raise the issue about, uh, first, you could say there's a legislative issue whether Canada ought to do what the US has done, which is to have an attestation by auditors. I should make clear that in the US, that's a very controversial requirement, and people have said it's too expensive for small companies. Whether it really is expensive is another issue. but. Probably in Canada, you could bring in at 500 million or something like that, so at least get 
some companies involved. The, the second issue that's related to that is, don't the auditors look at internal controls anyway, even without an attestation report? Well, we hope they do. And the question is, what sort of dialogue do they have with management? I've served on uh, too many audit committees. Boy, are those boring meetings, I'm telling you. <laughs> they go on for hours. And uh, what I've come to believe is the real issue is not which seems to be the, the, the thrust of this Hansen, the Hansen paper is between shareholders and the board. The real issue in audit is between management and the board. If you let management run the show, if the auditors feel that they are chosen by management, they're accountable to management, they're being paid by management, then I can assure you they will listen to management. But I, what I've seen in the last 10 years is a real evolution where audit committees now believe, and they do. They're the ones who hire the auditors. Whether you believe in rotation or not, I'm all in favor, and I did this once at, at Fidelity, every 10 years to have an RFP, let the existing auditors uh, come in and bid. But the key thing is that the auditors will feel they're beholden to the audit committee members, that not that they're beholden to management. That's the critical change. And being the person who hires them and compensates them is a very good start in that direction. So I believe that that's really critical. And then the other thing that relates to this is um, how are the board of directors uh, chosen? And <laughs> the first board I was on uh, was the Canadian board, a very large company. And this is how I got on it. Uh, one of the board members called me up and said the CEO was going to be in Boston. Would I have dinner with him? So we had dinner. At the end of the dinner, he's, he said to me, do you want to come on the board? And I did. Uh, five years later, I went on the Medtronic board, and I was, the first person who spoke to me was the head independent director. And I only saw the CEO at the end of the process. Now, probably, fairly speaking, the CEO, if he really hated my guts, would have had a veto. But I felt that I was being chosen by the independent directors through the nominating committee. And that's really critical. So you know, are these directors chosen in a professional way? We see more and more search firms. We see more expertise involved and um, a much broader group. And so I'm proud to say we see fewer and fewer people who are like you know college roommates of the CEO, and or their golf partners of the CEO. I mean that's that's really bad. So that's the key, is that the audit committee, the auditors have to feel they're being hired by the audit committee, not by management, and the audit committee needs to feel that they're being chosen by other directors, of with peer pressure, that they're not just uh, uh, shills for management. So I think those are the most critical things in terms of the way uh, audit uh, gets done. Now, in the second part, I just, you know, the, here's the first, my quick summary of this conference. Uh, the, the lawyers who are paid the most in the US to defend management got together, held a conference, invited no one like me, and came up with two <coughs> insights. One is that companies don't take a long-term approach. They're too short-term oriented. And second of all, and here I quote, institutional investors are pressuring companies for quote unquote, high immediate returns, okay? So this, these are the five things I have to say about this. First of all, there is no definition of long-term. What do we mean by long-term? Three years, five years, 10 years, 20 years? Is that what we're talking about? Well. You ask these corporations what it is, and they're all over the place. Depends on the industry, depends on lots of things. But what's interesting is it's not very long term. The consensus number is about three or four years, not 10 or 15 years, if you survey these people. And directors have total discretion to pick the short term, the medium term, the long term, whatever they want. How do I know this? Because I've watched Delaware courts over the years, 
And although I'm a finance guy, I actually have a law degree from Yale Law School, so I think I understand what's going on there, is it, somebody sued Citigroup, the board of Citigroup, to say, hey, you guys uh, seem to not have done a good job. Like, you lost $50 billion of market cap, and you had all these mortgages that went sour. The court said, they tried. <laughs> They, were, they acted in good faith. They had deliberations. So, I mean, if those guys aren't held, no one will. The only companies in which directors have ever been held liable that I know of are WorldCom and Enron. If you go bankrupt, that's a different story. So, we don't need any change in the law. We don't need B corporations or all those other things. Directors have all the discretion they want. Uh, they should. Uh, be very clear with their shareholders about what it is. They can put out an objective statement, so it's not necessary to change the law. Okay, the second thing is, um, is it good for a company to be long-term oriented? The answer simply is maybe. We have companies already, look at all the biotech companies. They don't make any money, and they have big, high valuations. Look at Amazon. In 20 years, they've probably had what, three profitable quarters? But people like them. They have a long-term approach. So the market already rewards long-term. <clears throat> but we've had some pretty big disasters when people went long-term. How do we know this? 75% of all mergers and acquisitions fail. So those people are trying to do something long-term. What's a good example? HP under Carly Fiorina. They bought Compact. They probably squandered $3 billion. I mean, they wrote it off within five or 10 years. And you know something? I've seen that happen a lot, unfortunately, on some of the boards I've been on. I can see, uh, you know, it, in Canada, we see lots of Canadian companies going to the US thinking they can compete. A few years later, right off a billion dollars, you know? So that's a long term approach. The answer is some people are good at long term and some people aren't. You know, some industries like software, if you're long term, it's over. <laughs> On the other hand, if you're building nuclear power plants, you've got to be long term. So it's really a misunderstanding about whether this is the, the implicit assumption the whole paper is long term is good. The answer is long term is good for those industries and those managers who know what, how to manage long term. It's bad for lots of other people. Third of all, <clears throat> there's a sort of schizophrenia about institutional investors in this whole uh, colloquium because on the one hand they're supposed to be too immediate oriented on the other hand we want them to participate more in choosing directors well if we're really long term we shouldn't want them the answer is institutional investors like everybody else there are some short-term people and some long-term people i've been in the community for years if you look at the statistics they aggregate high frequency hedge funds with institutional investors that are pension funds. They're all there. Now, if you disaggregate them, you can see that the average holding period of institutional investors is in the three-year range. Of course, if you bring in the high-frequency traders who trade literally within two minutes, it sort of takes your average very far down. But that's really not the group. There's some nasty words said in this colloquium about index funds. It's also, did you see the Wall Street Journal article where they suggested that index funds no longer be allowed to vote in shareholder elections? I mean, what a crazy idea. Are institutional investors that are index funds, are they really not reading the proxies? The answer is they are. How do I know that? Index funds is an economy of scale game. You've got to be very big to charge somebody three basis points or five basis points for an index fund. So most of the index fund's assets in the US are run by <coughs> Fidelity, Vanguard, BlackRock, State Street. I mean, they're all big, big, big players and they all have big proxy groups and they all, you may disagree with them, but they all do a serious job of looking at proxies. Does everybody look at ISS, the shareholder service? Of course they read it. That doesn't mean they follow it. There are a small number of small managers that probably do follow ISS, but actually it's not the big index funds. 
fourth point is one thing in this debate that always creeps in is these activists. What terrible guys these activist funds are. Here's the irony that activist funds have been the biggest force for good corporate governance in the United States. They really have because they actually blow the whistle on a lot of situations. But remember, they only have 2% of the stock. They can't win. They're not like a takeover bid. In a takeover bid, somebody is offering you a lot of money, right? These guys are offering you a program which they say will enhance shareholder value. And if you're an index fund, and you're a fund like Fidelity that's so big you can't move the stock very easily, you're not interested whether it's going to move the stock in a month or two months because it's not going to help you that much. So this schnook with 2% of the stock has to, why does that person have so much influence? The answer is only if the institutional investors back him or her. If they don't, they have nothing. They're not offering people money, they're offering a program. And if you look at the statistics, you wouldn't be surprised to see that activists win 40 to 60% of the time. That means they lose 40 to 60% of the time. Like everything else, some programs that activists offer are good and others aren't. How do I know that? Think about it. Apple, Apple has $150 billion of cash on its balance sheet and it wasn't paying a dividend. Now, people say, well, in the long term, you've got to take cash and invest it. Apple has no way to invest $150 billion reasonably. No one that I know of. Even Jeff Bezos probably couldn't invest $150 billion reasonably. So now they're paying a dividend. And now, all of a sudden, the board of uh, and Tim himself say, it's a good idea. It's a good idea we pay a dividend. So. The fact is, that was a good case in which the activists correctly assessed that. Uh, another thing are spinoffs. Well, some spinoffs make sense and some spinoffs don't. I've seen a lot of CEOs who say to me privately, this activist forced us to dispose of a company that we should have anyway. And you know what? The very threat of activists leads to better corporate decision making because people now under advice from, from people like me say, you ought to do a simulation of an activist and see what the activist would say about your corporate governance, about your board, about your dividend, about your whether you have divisions that don't make any sense. And so people do that. The hardest thing in companies is to sell a, a weak division or a division that doesn't really fit in. It's very difficult to do, but usually, you know, it makes sense, uh, but it's hard to do. Good. So, last thing. What's the cure to long-term versus short-term? To me, it's all in the executive comp. It's all in the executive comp. And most CEOs of companies get paid bonuses based on one-year performance. So, if we want them to be very long-term, we ought to pay them on three-year performance. I don't know whether Leo Strine's proposal goes to that, but it's, it's clearly that. And the second thing that goes along with this, when they do get stock, when they vest, they can't blow it out, in my view. They've got to hold it. What many of these people wait in stock options, especially to top the market, and then they blow it out, and they don't keep it. I want them to keep half of it. Uh, and if they keep half of it, then they have a long-term interest. And last thing, because I wrote a piece in the Wall Street Journal, is compensation committees follow earnings report by basing their comp on adjusted earnings. Adjusted earnings is just another way of saying we're excluding certain gap categories. We don't like it. I mean, we don't like something like restructuring, litigation cost, uh, you know, uh, and of course, uh, stock option expense. We don't like that either. But really, think about it. How could you exclude stock option expense in a comp criteria where you're giving stock options to the very people who you're excluding it. You, can, you better have a very good reason for excluding it. And if you look at those comp reports, and I looked at all of them, you can see they don't even explain it well. They say there's some sort of adjusted earnings, and you can't even figure out what it is that is the criteria. So at the minimum, we ought to say 
as institutional investors, try not to use adjust earnings, but if you do, explain why you're using it and quantify the difference between what you're using in GAAP, and then we'll know. Uh, I'll end by saying this, is the Merck CEO in 2015 met his EPS target by five cents, but it turns out it's an adjusted EPS target that's $3.50 when its GAAP EPS was $1.80. <laughs> so he made it, but is that really the right number? I'll end there. Thank you.